how does General Shinseki prepare for a war to be fought years into the future? How does he test an objective force that is a decade and a half away from completion? The answer is virtual war, run at the Army War College in an elaborate computer-assisted simulation. It is a week-long exercise played by hundreds of high-ranking officers who will see if Shinseki's future force can deliver a victory in a major future war. Frontline's cameras are the first to film the Army's highest level strategic war game. During the period from 25 August until late November 2014, the NIR began the clandestine pre-positioning of supplies and equipment. The year is 2014, and a new Middle Eastern power called the Near threatens war, when a neighboring U.S. ally begins controlling the waters of a new dam it has built on the Euphrates River, jeopardizing Near's vital water supply. The incident precipitates an international crisis. In the early morning hours of February 10th, 2015, Mir's special forces move to head off U.S. intervention by destroying the ports and airfields the U.S. and NATO would need to deploy their forces. What I'd like you guys to do is to determine, if you can, where is the central vulnerability of U.S. and uh, coalition forces in the Gulf. Colonel Greg Fontenot, a former director of the Army's elite school for advanced military studies, plays the Mir's commanding general. The logic of, of no sanctuary for blue is inherent in our uh, planning. You, know, you allow the United States no free ride. This is not going to be any sort of a hasty attack. We're, we're trying to feel them out. Across the hall, Marine General Paul Van Riper prepares the blue team, representing the United States and NATO forces. Once you've uh, interdicted him to the point that he no longer can continue his move to link up with the 50th, so he goes to the ground. Both he and Fontenot will enter their operational decisions into the gaming computer, and a team of observers will judge which forces will win. There's a, a thinking enemy in another location in this building that's trying to counter everything we're doing. So it's not, uh, it, we're talking about putting it into the computer, but on the other side of the computer is a, is a real human being trying to win just as hard as we're trying to win. Is there an opportunity to embarrass them by causing large casualties in one of their units that may uh, weaken the national will of the United States? And Fontenot begins waging psychological warfare on U.S. public opinion, striking at carefully selected targets in order to inflict maximum casualties and weaken America's will to fight. The strategic benefit would be uh, many body bags being loaded and sent to Dover. Okay. Got it. He decides to sink the Lincoln, a U.S. aircraft carrier with a 5,000-person crew. In any case, I want you to look at the Lincoln Battle Group. If we can have the Lincoln scene on CNN listing and sinking in the Gulf, that would be a great and wonderful thing. Although the Lincoln does not sink, she is severely damaged. Mir also takes the war to the U.S. homeland. Noticing that the Army contracts out its shipping needs, Fontenot targets a private Air Express company, hoping to deny spare parts to the Army fighting abroad. When the U.S. refuses to heed Fontenot's threats against the company's deliverymen, his commandos attack its U.S. headquarters. And to me, that offers advantages because you're coming from an unexpected direction. General Van Riper ignores Near's attacks on American soil, but time is running short if the U.S. commander is to prevent Near's forces in theater from linking up. Uh, sir, I still think that we need to start talking in terms of the extended time this is going to take to pull out and the number of casualties to do this. Van Riper acts decisively, quickly sending in the future objective force. U.S. troops arrive on the battlefield a full week before Fontenot had expected them, throwing off his timetable. We're facing the objective force, which we know is a very capable force, so there shouldn't be too much hand-wringing going on, going, gee, they went deep fast. We knew they were going to go deep fast. Now, can they sustain it? That's the strategic issue. 
however, does sustain the fight, and the judges determine that after 120 days of fighting, Nier's forces will be defeated. Chief of Staff! Shinseki was encouraged by the results, which showed that the force of the future gave the U.S. an advantage of speed and staying power. Are there things you would adjust now if you were to run that vignette again? I wouldn't go. I mean, my lesson learned was if you can't achieve operational strategic surprise, don't go. Back on. Certainly it's Greg's admission that his plan came apart uh, when he saw the speed with which our units arrived. And it's that speed that created for him conditions that he was not willing to accept to go the next step. But critics point out that the victorious objective force was equipped with weapons like the future combat system, which is unbuildable with today's technology. And what we see now is this increasing tendency in the Pentagon to project 15, 20, even 30 years into the future, making very specific predictions about weapons that will exist, threats that will exist, and then constructing these war games and say that proves our point. It's a fantasy. Critics also fear that in Shinseki's quest for a rapid response, the general himself might be looking to fight the last war, not the next one. The army is focused uh, overwhelmingly on resolving the task force heart problem. Uh, when you hear the Army talk about the, the interim brigade formation, uh, the phrase you keep hearing is, uh, we're going to deploy that brigade 96 hours after wheels up. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, if you look at uh, the risk, uh, the growing risk to forward bases, uh, that's uh, almost akin to the Army saying, we're going to get to the 21st century ambush point more quickly. It's like Custer saying, I want to get into the valley faster. I have tremendous respect for Andy Krepinevich. And I think he is right in the sense that it's not a permanent solution. But I see it as a critical transition to the force of the future. But what I think General Shinseki, God bless him, has realized is that the Army's obese. What we, the Army has is a 20th century industrial age force, a fine industrial age force, but nonetheless a 20th century Army. We need to start building a 21st century army, and we are running late. But where are the places America's 21st century army should fight? And can the nation come to a consensus on the conflicts it should prepare for? Are the medium brigades the new American cavalry? And are the world's back alleys the frontier they should secure? Is this the price we pay for preeminence? Or a strain on our forces we cannot afford? You do have a choice. You can either decide, we don't do windows, we're not going to do peacekeeping operations, we don't do stuff like that. Let these things go where they're going to go, and then go fight the large-scale war when it breaks out because you have interest in that region. Or you can decide that we're going to make a down payment on preventing future conflict in the form of peacekeeping missions and keep this from erupting into something that is in fact going to be very painful and difficult to deal with if we let it get out of hand. This is the gray area known in the military as operations other than war. It has become so much a part of army life that places like Fort Lewis have incorporated civilian encounters into their training exercises. This is the first time this squad will have to deal with the ambiguities of a local ethnic conflict. What do you do this for? And the challenge to you is to understand how do you organize your forces, your limited forces, to do all of those things when the conditions change very quickly as they can in places like Kosovo in 20 minutes from what was a peacekeeping mission into a war fight.